All right, welcome, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the quick select algorithm. Now, the quick select algorithm is very similar to the quick sort algorithm. It relies on the same pivot operation, um, but the algorithm is being posed to serve a different purpose. Quick sort, of course, is meant to sort and sort a list. Uh, quick select is meant to solve a different algorithm or a different problem. Um, so the problem that we're actually trying to look at here is the one that I've got presented here. Uh, it's called the kth smallest element and uh, this particular problem is usually best defined if we only have unique elements in our list. Um, things get a little confused otherwise, uh, but let's for the moment assume we do. Um, then what we can see here is that our input is the same as the sort procedure. We have a list of elements, uh, but here we want to uh, select out the element where a sub i, where a sub i is greater than or equal to exactly uh, k different values of j. So for instance, if we put in k equals 1 here, so our, um, well, if our input here was k equals 1, we're asking for the minimum element. And if we put our input k here uh, to be n, we're asking for the maximum element. And then maybe more importantly, if we pick our k to be you know n over two, you know, maybe floor or ceiling that to make sure we get an integer, then we're picking out a median element, the median element, and maybe that's again what we're what we're looking for here uh, with the select procedures. We want to be able to select any element we want of any rank uh, out of our list. So we can see that this is related to sorting. Sorting asks us to put them all in order in rank. Uh, this is a slightly easier problem, or at least it seems slightly easier, because we're only asking for one element of a very specific rank. Now, the reason why I want to look at this is, again, this is a great opportunity for us to think about our divide and conquer design strategy. Again, finding the self-reductions from the main problem to the sub-problem. And again, uh, Tony Hoare uh, helped solve this problem. Um, the quick select problem uh, in the same way that he helped solve the sort problem with the quick, the quick sort algorithm. So he developed this and we're going to take a look at that in a little bit more detail um, how that algorithm works right now. Okay, just to refresh from uh, the last video or an earlier video, we already looked at the pivot operation uh, and we concluded that it was uh, a, a theta of n or a linear time operation and we're going to make use of this pivot operation again in this video just remind yourself that the pivot operation here uh, splits our list into three sets the set of elements equal to our pivot the set of elements less than our pivot and the set of elements greater than our pivot all right so uh, to investigate the sol quick select algorithm uh, i want us to think a little bit about the problem uh, and to do that, I want to you know consider uh, consider this in a little little more detail over here. Uh, to start out, I'm going to need something to uh, refer to the output of my quick select problem. Now I'm going to use e as my function this time. E uh, uh, e for select to not confuse it with s for sort that I used in the previous video. Now in this case, uh, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a list that I'm trying to select an element out of and I'm going to get a uh, element k. This is an integer telling me the rank of the element that I want to select out. Now, we're going to recursively define this and we're going to want to think of, again, we're thinking recursively, we're thinking as a self-reduction and since we're thinking recursively we want to start by thinking of a terminating case or a simple case. And for me, that usually is a couple cases. Actually, we could say here um, uh, we're thinking about the size of A, which we sometimes are calling N, but I haven't indicated that yet. But let's say, what are we going to? What are some easy cases for the size of A? Now, there is one one uh, case. Sometimes we go all the way down. We say, what if the size of A was zero, an empty list? Now, unfortunately, for the select problem. It doesn't seem well defined on an empty list. If we're selecting out an element of some rank, usually we want there to be an element of that rank. So this is probably not a good. Uh, this is probably not a good case. So let's delete out 
R0 here and say, well, let's pick the next case up then. The next case is probably if the size of my list is 1. Now, if the size of my list is 1, given my input rules, my input rule on k is it has to be between 1 and n. Well, in this case, if n is 1, then we only have one choice. We're selecting the minimum element or the maximum element. They're the same. So let's just return that element. There's only one element in this list. It's probably, it has to be the element you're asking for. So in the case of a list of size 1, we'll just return out the element that you're asking us for. Now what I want to do is I want to, again, maybe think about the problem here. So I'm going to just give us sort of like a little example list here. Okay. Now let's imagine what we've done is we've performed the pivot operation. So I've got my pivot here. And I've performed it in such a way that I've put all the elements to the left over here. And same thing over here. All the elements greater are in the right subproblem that I've moved over here. So if I've done this, we know that if from the last video, uh, that if we were doing quick sort, that means p, our element p, is actually in the right location. It's in, it's, it's in the right location if we were trying to sort the list. All these elements are less than it, all these ones are greater than it, so it's exactly in the right location. Now I am going to just take a second here and say, let's say that the number of elements in the left hand side here, I'm just going to give it a number, I'm going to call it s for the moment. Okay. So there's a possibility here that if the input value I was looking for here, k, if it was equal to s plus 1, then what I'm asking for is I'm asking for the element that would be put in this location here if, if we were properly sorted. Well, we just argued that the pivot, p here, is in the right location if it were properly sorted. So if we got lucky and our k was asking us for that position, and we're lucky when our k is equal to s plus 1, then we just have to return our pivot. And so this is going to be a special case here. I'm going to consider here, well, well, if a is greater than 1 now, but also, and what did we say here, and k is equal to s plus 1. And if k was equal to s plus 1, we said the right answer is the pivot. I'm just going to call it pivot here. So answer the pivot. Return the pivot. Okay, so that looks like it's going to give us a couple other cases now. Now the other possibility is the k that we're asking for here, we got lucky it was here. What if it was over here instead? Okay, so what does that mean? That means we're still in this case if a is greater than 1, but now it looks like now it looks like k is less than s plus 1. Or k is less than or equal to s is another way we can state that. But if we're down here, now what that means is the element we're looking for, the kth smallest element, remember, is it must be one of these elements in the left-hand side because we know it's smaller than our pivot or rather, let's put that a different way, where we know that there are s elements that are smaller than our pivot. So the element we're looking for could not possibly be the pivot because uh, there's too many elements that are smaller than it. Okay. So the one we are looking for must be one of these elements that is smaller than it. And if we were looking for it, it would still be the kth smallest in this list. So again, let's let's put a value to k just to make it a little easier to talk about. Let's say our k was 3. So in the entire list, what we were looking for was the third smallest. And maybe our pivot here, our pivot ends up in location uh, too high. Maybe it's in position 7. Okay. So we know there are six elements over here that we still need to search for. And we know that the element we're looking for is one of them because those six elements are all less than our pivot. And also we know that the element we're looking for, since we were looking for the third smallest in the whole set, it must be the third smallest in this set. So we can actually go ahead and do a recursive call here, where we're going to do, again, E. We're going to search now not for the, uh, sorry, not, not the whole list anymore, but we're only going to search this list. Which list? The left list. And we said, we're going to search it for still searching for the kth smallest. Okay, that's actually our easier case. 
Um, let's say that wasn't the case. Let's say, oh no, our k is in the right-hand side. So that's our last case. Let's see if we can figure out what that one's going to be equal to as well. Uh, so greater than 1, and what do we say here? k is uh, now greater uh, than s plus 1. Three possible cases, equal, less than, greater. That's how we know we're exhaustive. We've covered all of our cases. Now our guess here is we're probably going to have to search these guys, the elements on the right-hand side, right? We're going to try and search them for some element. But now here's the problem, is once, uh, when, we, when we've discarded these elements here to, to only focus on the right-hand side, we've discarded a bunch of elements that were less than or equal to the element we're looking for which means we've changed the rank where it used to be the kth smallest in the whole group, the whole set, by discarding these ones that are smaller than it, it's no longer that kth smallest. It's gotten smaller. Its rank has gone down. How much has it gone down? Well, we discarded s plus one elements that are smaller than it. So if it was in rank k before, it will be in rank k minus s minus one. So again, we're going to look for the element in this right-hand subgroup that is in rank k minus s minus 1 because that element would be in rank k minus s minus 1 plus s plus 1, canceling those out, in rank k in the original list. And that was the one we were looking for. So again, our quick select algorithm operates here. Again, still doing that pivot operation, but then realizing the element we're looking for will only be in one subproblem or the other. And for that reason, this gives us kind of a binary search-like feel, at least in the sense that, uh, oops, at least in the sense that we're only going to do one recursive call or the other instead of doing both of them. Okay, in the quick sort algorithm, we do both of these. All right. But in the quick select, these are two distinct cases, so we're going to end up doing one of them or the other. Now, because of that, um, we're going to maybe get a different runtime coming out of our quick select algorithm than we might get out of our quick sort algorithm. Um, so let's take a second to maybe look at that. But before I do that, I want to, you know, uh, let's just revisit. I've got the, the same reduction over here on the slides. Um, but we can now here, once again, like we did for our previous case, uh, we can try and convert this self-reduction into recursive code. And there's not too much here that's tricky or different. Um, we've translated this test here into this A equals B instead. Okay. Uh, it looks like there's an error there. There should be A sub A copying down properly here. Um, but otherwise, we're going to perform our pivot subroutine. Remember, that's going to take a linear amount of time to do that. But when we're done, we end up with these three components, the left, the right, and the, the set of pivots. Um, because we use s in our calculations up here, we are going to say what s is. So we'll say let s be the size of the left-hand side. And then we just have our, our three tests. So if k is equal to s plus 1, we just return the pivot. Otherwise, if k is greater, we have one recursive call or the other. So again, fairly straightforward to convert a self-reduction into recursive code. Okay, so as mentioned when we looked at the uh, analysis of uh, the quick sort algorithm, the, the challenge comes in not knowing the size of the, sub, the, the two recursive calls that we make. And again, if we're lucky, we maybe split our, our set in half, otherwise we might get one that's got everything in it and the other with nothing in it. Um, and so we, we took a look at this in the last case. Uh, how we select the pivot isn't going to uh, you know, give us a good pivot or a bad one, at least out of the few pivot selection strategies we've looked at. Uh, so let's again see if we can turn our attention maybe to uh, worst case uh, and best case uh, runtimes for this recursive algorithm. Okay, so this algorithm is slightly different than the previous one. So when, when we look at quick sort, um, we had two possibilities for our runtimes. 
um, we did, we're going to have the same thing here, worst case and, and best case. In my worst case here, uh, if my n is, uh, we decided less than or equal to 1 here, in my worst case here, in the recursive case, I have one of these two recursive calls I need to make. But just like in, in the quick sort case, if we're unlucky, it has all the other elements in it. We've only reduced the size by eliminating the pivot. And so our pivot operation still takes this uh, extra amount of work here. So in this case, we end up with this self-reduction, and this is the exact same worst case as our quick sort. And we showed in our last video that this is an n squared algorithm. So unfortunately, quick select isn't that quick at all um, in the worst case scenario, which is unfortunate uh, for us. Um, we're going to see down the road that might we, there might be a way for us to get a little bit better than this. Um, and maybe um, we can see that there is going to be some benefits to running quick select other than um, just trying to get this worst case. Now remember this worst case happens when we keep getting really bad pivots, which hopefully are unlikely in the randomized case. Okay, but well, let's take a look at the best case here. Now the best case, it's a little bit hard to characterize because there's, there's more than one best case that are maybe worthwhile saying uh, are the best case. Now one best case is with early termination. Now early termination means we're only going to perform our pivot step once. So our actual best case with early termination is going to be um, linear without too much argument. But I wanted to look at a slightly different case, which may be not exactly our best case because of the early termination condition, which is what happens if we got half of our list to recurse on? Now again, the actual best case is replacing this term with zero, basically a t of zero. Uh, there's no recursive call at all. Um, but um, we may, if we want to say, well, what's the best case if we actually have to recurse all the way down? Okay, maybe we don't get lucky and early terminate. Well, then this would be the best case. Okay, so this is the recurrence relation that I want to work with, at least the recursive component. Um, and there's more than one way I can do this, but I think this is going to be maybe easy enough for us to try just the substitution method. I'm going to say uh, t of n, what's it equal to? I'm going to drop out the floors just to make it a little easier for us to work with here. t of n over 2 plus dn. Uh, if we apply the substitution method once to this, we're going to get t of, it looks like, n over 4 in here, plus a dn over 2, plus a dn. One more time, we'll get t of n over 8, plus dn over 4, plus dn over 2, plus dn. We can see a pattern uh, forming here. So it looks like dot, dot, dot. We're going to get to a point here where this is going to be something like a t of, I don't know, an n over 2 to the i, plus, and then it looks like we get a sum here. I'm going to use j since I used i over there. Uh, j equals 0. It looks like we have a 0 here. And what do we have? We have a dn over 2 to the j. And it looks like we end at, if this is 3 and this is 2, this must be i minus 1. Okay. Very quickly through the substitution method to get down here. Remembering when we get down to level k, so maybe we'll say this is t of 1 at some point, and this n over 2 to the k equals 1, so that's going to be uh, k equals log n, um, plus, and then we're going to get this sum here j equals 0, except it's up to k minus 1 now, of dn over 2 to the j. Now one reason I wanted to bring this out is this is another sum that we might want to look at in more detail. I'll maybe finish this off. This one's obviously just a c. That's not going to be the dominant term. So this is the term we want to look at. I'm going um, to go ahead and bring the dn out front. And we're left with this, and maybe I'll write it like this so we can see very clearly that this is a geometric series. Uh, again, geometric series of base to the power that we're summing over. And we have a formula for this, and if you go and pl plug in the formula for this right now, it's going to lead you down the wrong way. And that's because sometimes we just have formulas 
and we think formulas are the right thing for us to plug in uh, just because we you know we looked it up on our cheat sheet or we saw it on Wikipedia or something turns out there's there's something here uh, this sum is one that I do want to look at in a little bit more detail uh, and again for all the sums that I think are important I've got little stories or little tales to remember them and so this one uh, I'm gonna give you a little story is about uh, Zeno's paradox all right, so Zeno, who's Zeno? Zeno is a great, uh, a great philosopher. Yeah, maybe he's a Greek philosopher. Is what I was trying to say. He's a Greek philosopher. Um, he's pre-Socratic, pre-Socrates and Aristotle and Plato. Those, those three important figures. Uh, so that means it's come from a fairly long time ago. Which means some of the puzzles that they pose are not super logical. Remember, Aristotle uh, really uh, formulated logic. So there's there's some logical errors in this paradox. See if you can spot them. So Zeno poses this paradox. He calls it where he's got this uh, this hero. This is our hero here. Our hero is Achilles. Achilles is very famous for being a very fast hero in Greek legend. Uh, and Zeno says, what if Achilles had to had to race a turtle? Now Achilles is very fast. That's my little turtle. He's not very fast. Uh, and he said, but not just any old race. We well, you know it's not fair since Achilles is so fast. So we're going to give the turtle a head start. And for the moment, I'm going to say the head start is one. One what? I don't know. One mile. Something. We give him a head start. Now what Zeno is, says, and what his paradox is, he says, uh, no matter how fast Achilles is, he says, Zen Achilles will never be able to catch uh, our turtle. Now the reason he says, before he gets there to the, catch the turtle, he has to get halfway to the turtle. And before he gets halfway to the turtle, he has to get halfway to, to halfway to the turtle. And before he gets halfway to halfway to the turtle, he has to get halfway to halfway to halfway to the turtle, uh, and so on. And, and you can see here, if you follow along with me, you can keep splitting this, whoa, and now we're getting to too small to see. You can keep splitting that little chunk that's left there in half again and get something even smaller. Okay, we were talking about math. So how does this help us with math? Well, if we look at this, this what he's done here, is what we've got here is we've got this is uh, one half. Um, this is one quarter then, and this would be one eighth, and this would be one sixteenth. And the whole length of this whole line is equal to the sum of all these pieces. How many pieces? All the pieces. So he's saying here, it's a slightly different sum. I'm going to write it. So he's not saying this. Zeno's not saying this. Zeno's wrong, by the way, right? Can Achilles, can Achilles catch the turtle? Of course, he can just take one big step maybe and jump over them. So that, that's the logical fallacy in this. Uh, Zeno doesn't have a great argument here. But what he helps us see with this proof is that if we take this one half and we raise it and we start at one, we get one half and we add one quarter and we add one eighth and we one, add one sixteenth and we add this all the way up to infinity the whole thing just adds up to one. And this is something that's really important for us when we have a geometric series like this and the value, the base here, is less than one, then we said that this, this infinite series converges. The whole thing is less than a constant. Which means here, I can go ahead and do this. Now, I, I have to be careful here. This one started at zero, not at one. Oh, actually, I'm going to do a couple steps at once here. C plus dn sum j equals 0 to infinity. I've just, when I said k minus 1 is less than infinity, right? 1 over 2 to the j. Now, this, I know this one actually has a, it's not 1. Because I started at 1 here, this one's 1. I have to add on the first one I have here, which is, one half to the power of zero, which is one. So the whole thing then must be equal to uh, two. So this whole thing must be equal to two. So we get z, or sorry, c plus two d n. So it looks like we've got n. All right, where did that come from? What was the point of that? Well, the point of that was doing uh, our recursive analysis on the best case. Uh, for our quick select 
if we were able to, uh, if we were, uh, if we had to recurse all the way down. That's what this one showed here. Okay, and we've just shown that. Well, our guess we didn't use we didn't use induction to prove this, but assuming we did our our substitution right, we've shown that this is a linear uh, algorithm or best case linear scenario. Okay, now actually uh, the reason I want to to bring this up, let's look at this in a little more detail. Um, so what we've just done here for our quick select is we said worst case is uh, n squared, but best case is n. Okay, let's think of a couple things that it does. So quick select allows us to pick out uh, the min or the max and we actually already have an algorithm that allows us to pick the min or the max and that algorithm is linear in both the worst case and the, and the best case. However, we also this also would allow us to select the median element and the median element we don't really know a quick way to do that in order n. Now let's see why this is. So if we want to find the minimum element of our list, okay, uh, usually what we do is we do one pass over it and we find that minimum element. Okay. Now let's say you wanted to find the second min. So we're trying to solve this select problem, right? If you want to find the select second min, you can go through the first time, delete out the first one, and then go through a second time and find it. Now that's going to take two n operations, which still order n. So if you want to find the third min, you're now at 3n, still order n. So finding the min, finding the max, and even finding the ones close by seem to be okay, they're order n. But it gets troublesome when we want the medium, the median, sorry, because it's the n over second min, which would, if we just use the same math, would give us n over 2 times n, well, n squared. Well, that's what that worst case for our quick select is coming in from. Is if we just try and do pass by pass by pass by pass, we're probably going to end up with n squared. Now we're still sort of question marks over here, and I'm going to leave that uh, for a later discussion, where the there is a better case if we can come up with a better way to select our pivot, and I'm going to show you in a later video. Uh, a sort of clever way to select our pivots to make sure we always get good pivots. And if we can always get good pivots, then we stay down here in this best case, which is where we want to be. All right, so this ends my discussion of the quick select algorithm, um, but I do want to uh, complete this series of videos with two more discussions, one which is an average case analysis of quick sort, and then we'll finish off with, as I mentioned just now, uh, a clever way to select our pivot so we always get a good pivot all the way down. Uh, all right, uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.